hit me from places like Tel Aviv. Great software. Seriously, that's all you got? Yeah. <laughs> Are we ready? Do we want to back into that? You can use DNA. Boy, those robots look cool performance. First time I wrote a professional computer program, it was, uh, I think, 95, and uh, it was super slow. Uh, it was barely usable. So I optimized it the way we did it in 1995. There it is. It is a two steps process to an optimized fast program. Step one was checking the stupid turbo button, which got stuck all the time. <laughs> and uh, I guess that many people here don't know what a turbo button is. For you kids, the turbo button slowed down the computer. Because uh, if you were running applications from uh, one generation before, uh, in particular games, they got too fast on current generation computers. So you used it to slow down the application. And sometimes you forgot to depress it, so everything got super slow and you wondered what was happening with your machine until eventually a few days after that you noticed. And uh, if that didn't work, the second option was to just sit and wait. Because soon enough, you would get a fast enough computer. I kid you not, that was actually the way we did it. Everybody was like, okay, this is so slow, but uh, just wait a few months. And the reason for that was, of course, more slow. Okay. You know the rap. Uh, the number of microtransistors on a chip will roughly double every couple of years. And actually, that's how it happened. This is a logarithmic scale, okay? This is the beginning of PCs, the 8080 here. And then you get 8086 and... 286, 386, 486, Pentium, Pentium 2, and 3, Pentium 4. And what you can see there is that if you look at the number of transistors, uh, an 8080 had barely a few thousands of them, while a Pentium 4 had a few tens of millions of them. And uh, the power of the computer was growing just the same. It was amazing, actually. And the power of the computer was growing like that, and clock speeds were going up like that. Uh, pretty much everything in computer was that crazy fast. Exponential improvement. Until it started leveling out. Uh, it didn't happen much very long ago. For example, this is a graph of clock speeds in particular. It starts leveling around 2005. Until 2005, clock speeds were improving like crazy. Now the clock speed of this computer is not much more than the clock speed of the previous generation computer that I owned. And now it's happening with uh, everything else. It's happening with uh, transistors on a chip, right? This was actually something we expected. There was this popular uh, paper from a few years ago. Who knows this? Well, what what it said was essentially, uh, so far, you've been optimizing by sitting on your hands and waiting for computers to get fast enough. No more. This is not going to happen anymore. Because more slow is not going to be valid in a few years. We can't make our transistors smaller like we used to. So forget about it. Now you've got to find some other way to optimize your software. This is not going to happen anymore. And uh, actually, what this paper was predicting started happening this year. 2016, this is the year that the microprocessor industry officially gave up on more slow. So for the first time, we are not going to try and double the number of transistors on chip. Why is that the case? Well, transistors are really tiny. Let me show you how tiny. Okay, this is a human hair. Uh, now, take this human hair. Make it real, real big. Like uh, twice as uh, the thickness of this. Make it twice as large as this room here. At that point, if you were at that scale, you could see the transistors. They would be about mm, 
four millimeters wide across really tiny okay just to be clear at this scale if you squint a little you can see your own DNA you can see atoms of course you can't see them because uh, you are way below the wavelength of visible light but you catch my drift so they are tiny it's hard to make them smaller we could make them smaller actually we could make them smaller by a few nanometers we are talking about seven nanometers now we could get down to two or three before the laws of physics of quantum mechanics start catching up on us but before then we are starting to uh, we are starting to fight against another power which might be even more powerful than the laws of physics and I'm not talking about love here essentially what happens is that building these microprocessors becomes so expensive that it's not worth it anymore so long story short we are not gonna get much better in that direction we are not gonna get a super powerful ship tomorrow now one thing that you could say is I don't want a super powerful ship tomorrow we're fine I mean what's uh, why should we have anything more powerful than we have maybe we don't need more powerful computers we just need more computers right we can parallelize most problems that we're having today actually there are problems that cannot be very easily parallelized there are a few fields where we just need more powerful machines and we can't get them one of these fields is artificial intelligence yes we are all amazed we are doing amazing stuff with artificial intelligence we are building computers who can beat us at go and uh, computers who can uh, identify phases better than a human can and so on and so forth but that's not the really hard stuff in uh, artificial intelligence weirdly enough pattern recognition yeah that's impressive but that's not the hard stuff you want to know what the hard stuff is you put that intelligence you put it in a body you ask the body to move around that's damn hard there is actually a competition organized by Google for robotics and uh, the robots are supposed to uh, simulate a rescue operation so first they got to drive a vehicle to a building and then they get into the building and they look for uh, people in trouble and they get them out and all the robots could drive to the building strangely enough driving is not a problem here is where is the problem so this guy wants to enter the building whoops yeah oops okay almost uh, this one managed to open the door and oh yeah it's embarrassing it's embarrassing look I love this one think about it no okay um, <laughs> one comment from a bystander at this competition was if you are really worried about the Terminator just close the damn door I mean <laughs> they are not gonna kill us all anytime soon okay not even if you if we pick very very uh, incompetent leaders which we wouldn't do anyway so so the problem we are having hmm? we want more powerful computers for stuff such as this one uh, and we can't have them not with the current technology so is there any other way any unconventional way to build a computer that will eventually get us there okay uh, to talk about that let me talk for a moment about how computers work in the rare occasions where they actually do uh, now this might sound below you sorry for people who have a specific training in engineering this might be obvious to you but not all developers know this I so I'm gonna explain it quickly in five minutes and I'm also gonna simplify things a bit so I'm 
gonna confuse uh, uh, current and tension and stuff like that from an electrical point of view I'm gonna make a mess so sue me it's uh, enough that I give you the basic idea about how things work this is a transistor okay it's a switch you get current in there nothing happens because the switch is open you get more current in there the switch closes current gets through that's how it works so how how can I use this for something useful well for example I can take a transistor put two transistors in a line like these and I connect another wire there I connect this thing here to mass and I call those the inputs and that one's the output so now if I apply current up there what happens where is the current gonna go well it's gonna go to the output remember I'm confusing current and tension here so bear with me it's gonna go there right because the circuit is open it can only go there so I get current on the output what if I apply current to the input like this is anything gonna change nope the circuit is still open same if I apply current to input 2 but not input 1 but if I apply current to both inputs then the circuit is gonna close and the current from there is gonna go down to mass so essentially we have a circuit here where the only way not to have current on the output is to have apply current to both inputs okay let's build a small table here explain this the only way not to have current on the output is to apply current to both inputs now let me replace current with true and no current with false and we got something that's called the logic gate and this particular logic gate is called a NAND again the only way to have false on a NAND is to have true at both inputs of the NAND okay what's a NAND good for try to connect the NAND's input like that so what happened now is that the two inputs are bound together these two lines in the table cannot exist anymore right so let's remove them and the input is actually one single input not two inputs right so let me remove that and what we have now is another logic gate you will recognize this one hmm? what's this good for let's try to put two knots in a line like this in parallel with an end what happens now how can I get no current there how can I get false from this circuit remember the only way to get false from an end is to have true at both inputs of the end which are right after not so the only way to do that is to have false at both inputs there so let's recap the only way to get false from this circuit is to get false at both inputs as soon as one of the inputs becomes becomes true the output becomes true right can you name this cool and now I built an OR and now I can build more stuff there is a zoo of these things and you put them together and I don't have time to show it to you but in some combinations they can actually store information so you can use these to build memory as well as processors but if I can build these then I can build the CPU and memory I can build a computer and the point I'm trying to make is why do we care about transistors we don't we care about transistors just because transistors are the best way we know to build this we care about these it's all about the logic gates okay so can I build the logic gates with something that is not a transistor course I can there are so many ways to build logic gates 
Can I build the logic gate with domino pieces? Sure I can. Let's build an OR. Can you imagine what's inside the box? True means that the domino pieces are falling. False means they're not falling. You can probably visualize how to build this. It's pretty easy, actually. Okay. Okay. Now, can you build an end with domino pieces? Just to be honest on you, this is not super easy. I'm not expecting. If you can do it, just, just like that, then respect. I wouldn't ever be able to. Uh, it takes some time. But if you sit down and you start thinking about it, you will probably come up with something similar to this. Yeah, there are a few timing issues and uh, the, the basic idea of this is all about this combination. Call it uh, an inhibitor. Okay, This line this circuit can be true and then it kicks off these two pieces from this other circuit so it turns it off it switches it uh, switches it off okay so essentially to get these to true this must be false which means that this must be true huh? and that other one must be true as well because uh, well it ends up here and, uh, well, try and build it for yourself. It works. It's an end. So we can build the logic gates out of domino pieces. And now we can build a computer out of the logic gates. It's not going to be the fastest computer. Uh, or the most reliable. In fact, uh, in this video, the computer is getting a calculation wrong. But, uh, well, okay, it's a computer. Uh, state transitions are super expensive. I mean, imagine going in and putting all those domino pieces up again, but you, you can't technically do it. Okay. Uh, so, domino pieces. Anything more weird that you can use to build logic gates with? Well, there is actually believable research. I think this one also won uh, an Ig Nobel Prize from Japan, I believe. Uh, that's about building logic gates for crabs. These are soldier crabs. They have a very reliable, very consistent swarming behavior. So if you build something like this here, uh, you see you put the crabs in those areas there. Sorry, I hate doing this but I can't reach it okay you put the crabs there and uh, this is the true false output and then there are those things called intimidation plates which are essentially casting shadow over the the crabs the crabs don't like shadow they associate it with the predator overhead so they start moving and if two bunches of crabs move, when they clash, they will reliably proceed in a direction that is the vector sum of the original directions of the two subgroups. So they will actually go together to the exit. Boom, we just build an end with crabs. Don't do that. Can you build a computer with this? Yes, it would be a very slow, crappy computer also, you know, it's a... Ha <laughs> ha! <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> yeah, it's a crappy computer, smart ass. <laughs> okay, so... Don't do that. It's a, my point is, I'm just trying to prove that you can do it. But of course, I'm not recommending using stressed out crabs instead of transistors. I, I mean, if electrons are not serving us well anymore, then we should probably be looking at something that is smaller than an electron, which a crab isn't. Uh, maybe faster than an electron. What's smaller than an electron? Yep, yeah, a photon. So maybe we can build computers out of light. And actually, this is a pretty recent achievement. IBM last year 
built the first fully light-based microprocessor. After all, we are already using light for this kind of stuff, right? I mean, we are using fiber optics. It's good for a very specific domain, sending a lot of data over long distances. Why aren't we using them for CPUs yet? Well, there are a few issues with that. Uh, we take an awful lot of energy to convert to and from light, and so on and so forth. So it's still up in the air whether this stuff will ever be able to replace normal computers. We don't know. Simply we don't know. But there is a lot of research going on there. Another thing that is probably slower, it's certainly slower than regular computers, but it has other advantages because it's very parallel and you can build gates out of it, is chemistry. This is something called the belusov zapotinsky reaction. It's interesting because... Uh, hey, can I hear? Boom. Yeah. It's interesting because it's cyclical different from most chemical reactions. Eventually it does stop, it still follows the second principle of thermodynamics, but uh, it goes on and on for a very, very long time. So it's being used as a basis to build a uh, computation, computers. Yeah. And another thing that people are looking at, and there is a huge amount of money invested in it, is uh, quantum computers. Google and IBM, they are building quantum computers. And quantum computers are interesting for a number of reasons. First of all, they are awesome to look at. I mean, it's a really cyberpunk, it looks amazing. And um, second, apparently they can be, they tell us a few million times faster than current computers. Why? Because a quantum gate, different from a logic gate, doesn't just have through a true state and a false state. It has a superposition, we are talking quanta here, so it can have many, many different states that coexist and then they collapse into one as soon as you look at the result. You know, quantum stuff, that weird stuff. And the problem with this, interestingly, is that they are building them and nobody knows whether they are working. And the debate is just maddening because people are like, people building them are like, look, it's doing computation. And other people are saying, no, that's, yeah, it's doing computation, but it's just doing a regular old fashioned computation. It's not quantum. No, it's quantum. Look at it. No, if I look at it, it's not quantum anymore because I collapsed the wave function. And uh, it goes on like this. It's just weird. The only way that we have to understand whether these things are working is to check whether they are million times faster than our computers, which is not going to happen until we build the technology there to surpass our current technology. So, uh, but now I'm cheating, because uh, when I started talking about quanta, I sneakily introduced uh, another topic. We're not talking about the regular, um, is it me making this weird sound? No. Okay. Are you feeling smart right now? <laughs> if it's a practical joke, that's Okay, I will just stop moving. Which for an Italian is brutal. I hope you don't mind, but I I will try to keep my arms tight. So I'm not talking about regular logic gates anymore. I'm talking about a different kind of logic gates. I'm talking about a different kind of computing that is not based on Boolean logics anymore. And once you give up to Boolean logics, uh, it, you open up a whole different can of worms. Actually, I don't hear the funny sound anymore, so you might be right that it was me. So what can you use in place of logic gates? If you decide that logic gates uh, are just, you know, constraining us. Well, you can use DNA, for example, to do 
all combinatorial calculations that would take forever. It's massively parallel after all. It's doing computation inside our bodies all the time. It proved to be pretty reliable. I mean, look at us. And uh, why not use it at this point to solve specific problems? You might not be able to build a computer that solves any problem out of DNA, but you will probably be able to build computers that solve a few problems really, really fast, which is what people are doing. And then, in particular, in this field, there is my absolute favorite, which is this thing. This creature, which is called Physarum polycephalum, is, um, it's also called the slime mold. It's not a mold, actually. Uh, it's like an amoeba. It's a very big amoeba, like huge. It's a single cell. It just has many nuclei. And uh, it has a few amazing properties. People are studying these both at the scientific level and at the level of, you know, hobbyists. Because, for example, one thing that it does is, uh, uh, for whatever reason, it likes oatmeal. So in this video, uh, there is uh, this maze which has been filled with the Pfizerum. It's a single individual, okay? And then this guy is gonna put oatmeal on two ends of the maze, like this. And what happens is that the creature tries to put its body over the oatmeal, right? This is sped up a few times. So it's a single creature, so it doesn't want to split. It still wants to be whole, but it tries to put all its mass over the oatmeal and it stays connected with that very thin line of amoeba. And the result of that, if you look at it, is that this is the shortest path through the maze. So this thing just sold the maze. And this is extremely reliable. It's been proven to work again and again which opens up a number of questions. One is, our idea of what intelligent means, uh, you know, I mean, this thing doesn't has, have a, a nervous system, let alone a brain, and it can solve mazes. So what does it mean to say that something is intelligent? What if we are just very complicated amoebas? That's actually not a joke. That's a serious question. I will leave that to you, especially on long winter nights. But uh, in the meantime, what people are doing is they're studying how the creature can do stuff like this and trying to apply that kind of biological-based computation to specific problems. For example, uh, this is Fizerum redesigning sorry, the US highway system. Uh, it takes a while, but ultimately it comes up with a solution that is pretty good. Once again, all these uh, topology-based problems, it can solve them quite well. Hmm. If you live in the US, you might actually envy this specific solution. Or you can use Fizerum to build um, uh, a lithographic map and build a circuit out of this. People have been doing it. Yeah, there are. If you like this kind of uh, weird experiments, there is actually a community online that is all about this creature. <laughs> yeah, Ghostbusters quotes, of course. <laughs> and uh, there are some amazing discussions here. Why does Pfizer like chocolate and so on? So, highly recommend it, okay? The point of all this is you can do computation in many possible ways. So, I guess uh, we're almost done. I have one minute, so I need to uh, say something that is a little bit more concrete, I guess. Yeah, quickly, in one minute. I will make three predictions for the short, medium, and long term. And um, uh, let's leave it at that. What's going to happen now with the current state of computing? The one for the short term is super easy, because it's happening now. 
if we need to go faster, but we can't go faster on a single computer, then we need more computers. And our current programming models are terrible for managing parallel programming. So we all know what's happening. We are uh, getting farther and farther away from mutex-based programming models towards programming models that actually help you parallelize, which means functional programming is all the fashion again. Hmm? So it's everywhere. And it's because of that. If you were wondering why everybody suddenly is a lisp head, that's because we need more speed and we need to harness the power of parallel computing. And try doing that with Java or Ruby, to be honest, for that matter. It's a nightmare. Medium term, apparently we are getting back to a world where uh, general purpose computation is a special case. If you want to be really fast, you need special purpose computers. For example, you want to solve a specific algorithm that might be just the right case for some kind of combinatorial, uh, chemically based computation. Which also means that you're probably not going to buy one of these computers, right? You're not going to buy a quantum computer. You don't want. Aha, uh -huh. wait a minute. That's not me. It's it's not that I don't want to be your guinea pig. It's uh but I enjoy this. Okay, I'm sticking here. So, my point here is uh, you don't want to put a quantum computer on your lap, probably. First of all, it runs close to zero Kelvin, so your lap is going to freeze. Also, it's probably extremely large and heavy, so your lap is going to get squeezed. So what's going to happen now? You are probably, in the long term, medium term, going to buy computing power for this computer from somebody else, from Google, say. And this means, essentially, the mainframe is back. The long pendulum swing that began in the early 80s when we started having personal computers might be starting to swing in the opposite direction towards large computers that are shared and you rent space on them. This is actually happening right now. People call it the cloud. To me, it's a damn mainframe. And finally, if you have many different computers for many different problems, I'm desperately trying not to move, guys. Try to bear with me. Feel my pain and gals. Um, this also means that you need programming models for all of these computers, right? I mean, what would the language for programming chemistry look like? It's probably not going to look like C. So this also means that we might specialize again. If we break down our general purpose programming approach into many different programming approaches for many different problems, maybe we are about to see a number of different programmers and a number of different approaches to programming, which means some kind of Cambrian explosion, some kind of huge differentiation of different kinds of computers. This might happen sometimes in the future. Of course, this is a, a forecast, so it's wrong. The good thing is that nobody will remember I made it by the time it's proven wrong. But something to think about in these uh, times of fast-changing uh, computing approaches. And, uh, well, three forecasts. I barely moved. Can't get much better than these. I know, thank you. <laughs> I love you too.